If you will, will you grab your Bibles and turn to Matthew 5, 48? Um, last time I preached on the Beatitudes and what they, um, what they mean to us and how we should live. And tonight I just want to continue that sermon, uh, Sermon on the Mount. So if you will, stand to your feet. And we're just going to read this one verse, uh, Matthew 5, 48. Matthew 5, 48. If you guys are there, let's go ahead and read that out loud. It's a short verse. It says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Let's try that again. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. All right, you may be seated, and I've already prayed, so... Um, I just wanted to focus in on this verse. Uh, it says, be perfect. And, you know, God calls us to be perfect. Um, if you will, go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians 13, and we'll look at verse 11. Um, in Genesis 17, 1, you know, God talked to Abram before his name was changed to Abraham. And Genesis 17, 1 says, and when Abram was 90, 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect. In Deuteronomy 18.13, it says, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Now let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians 13.11. It says, When I was a child, I spake as a child, and I understood as a child. Wait, that's not the right one. Sorry, that's 1 Corinthians. That is good. You know, don't speak like a child. All right, that's not what I'm talking about tonight, though. Uh, 2 Corinthians. Well, I got it right here. It says, finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Um, so God's will for our lives is perfect, is what that verse is saying. Let's go ahead and turn back uh, to Romans 12.2. Romans 12.2 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what it, that is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So God's will, like I said, is, is perfect. God's will for our lives. And also, God is perfect. Let's turn to 2 Samuel 22. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. And then you guys are in 2 Samuel 22, let's read 31 through 34. 31 through 34 says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust him. For who is God save the Lord, and who is a rock save our God? God is my strength and power, and he maketh my, my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet, and setteth me upon the high places. So God, you know, Matthew 5.48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You know, we are called to be perfect, and God is perfect, and he wants us to be perfect through him. So let's go back to Matthew 5, and let's read uh, the verses prior to 48. And let's uh, read some of the things that, in the context of this message, this sermon, what are we supposed to be perfect about? Okay, so let's start in Matthew 5, 21. And I'm going to skip around a little bit because it's a lot of verses. Um, let's read Matthew 5, 21. It says, Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. And the word Raka there, it just means, it's a word that signifies being empty or being a beggarly or foolish. It's a term of extreme contempt. It's basically talking down to somebody and calling them a name. I think we could all use our imagination to think of names that we use in today's vernacular that would be something you wouldn't want to call somebody. Now go ju jump down to verse 27. 
Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And then jump to verse 31. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communications be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whosoever, whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. And then verse 38, Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him also the other. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And then look at 43. Ye, uh, ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good unto them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye, what do ye more than others? Do, ye, do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So the title of the sermon tonight is Be Ye Therefore Perfect. So Jesus here is preaching on um, Old Testament laws. He's teaching on traditions. He's teaching on things people have heard just building upon the way that certain that these people thought about life. And I was as I was going through this, I was looking at all of them, and this is the way that most people do live their lives now in today's world. So this is not just some irrelevant message, but this is what society is still wants us to live a certain way, to hate our enemies, for an example. Um, but so Jesus kind of took all of that and he stepped it up a notch. And he took everything sort of, I mean, I hate to say to the next level, but I mean, he, he took something that you had this preconceived idea. He said, that's what you think, but really it's, it's this. And it was much more, more stricter way to behave um, and, and act. So uh, the first one is that, um, that thou shalt not kill. Okay, now that's pretty... Uh, self-explanatory but then Jesus is saying but don't even be angry at your brother without a cause because you know prior to this it's like well I didn't kill the guy well but you were really upset with him and without a cause so we're not even supposed to be upset with people or angry at them without a cause now there is a time for anger there's righteous uh, indignation there's a time God gets angry we can be angry at certain things that like get angry at sin um, but we need to have a cause if we're going to have anger. And then also it says that when I was talking about calling uh, people names, okay, well, if you didn't uh, call someone necessarily a bad name, like this name Raka would have been a very insulting comment. Well, I think people justify their behavior today is like, well, I didn't call him thus and so, or I didn't call him this, but you did call that person a fool. So we're not supposed to even call people just the simple word of a fool. So um, those are the first two. And then the next ones I'm going to break down a little bit more. Um, so the next one is about adultery. It, um, do not commit adultery. Okay, that's pretty self-explanatory. I think we all know what that is. But then Jesus is saying, don't even look on a woman to lust. The, basically, that is the same as committing adultery. It doesn't have the same results, but it's the same result of the mind. Um, now, this is really, 
I think this one is a really obvious one for us, and we know not to commit adultery. Uh, but what about spiritual adultery? The Bible talks a lot about spiritual adultery, and it warns about this. And so using this as a principle, we should not even look upon other gods. Okay, so Jeremiah 3, 7 and 8 says, and I, and I said, after she had done all these things, Turn thou unto me, but she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw. He's talking about the nation of Israel. And I saw when all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of, of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So here is an entire nation, people of God. They committed adultery, spiritual adultery, against God the Father. Um, Jeremiah 10, verse 2 says, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. So the heathen culture of this day, they did certain things, and God said, Don't even, don't even look at it. Don't learn how they're doing things. Deuteronomy 12, 1 through 4, says, These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land, which the Lord God of the, thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye live upon the earth. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God. So here's when they're going into, like I said, they're going into the foreign land and they're taking it over. They're going to possess it. And there are in place all these ways that people are worshiping their gods. And God said, do not do that unto me. Deuteronomy, later on in chapter 12, 30 to 32 says, Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord, which he hateth, have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. What what thing soever I command you, observe to do it, thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. So God is not interested in being worshipped the same way that heathen gods are worshipped. And, you know, in our society, there are, there are idols and there are gods that we put in our lives. And there are things that people do that kind of creep their way into church, you know, and God does not want anything to do with that. So the next one is going to be uh, divorce, okay? Legal divorce. So all I really want to say about this one is that if you get tired of your spouse or you grow apart, that is not grounds for divorce. You know, there was a time when there was um, laws about how to divorce, and um, you know, Jesus said that there is no divorce allowed except that by fornication. And um, so uh, I'm just, that's all I'm going to say about that one. The next one, swear an oath by God. So um, let's read that one. That's Matthew 5, 33. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but per shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. So this is not talking about swearing as in cussing. This is talking about swearing an oath. And um, you know, what I wrote down about this is that we should be a straight shooter. Now, who's heard of that saying, a straight shooter? I had to educate somebody about a couple months ago. They had never heard of that. So... You know, be, be a straight shooter, be, and keep your uh, communication simple, okay? James 1, 19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Proverbs 17, 28 says, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that 
shutteth his lips, is esteemed a man of understanding. So, um, you know, let your word be enough. Okay, the Bible says in verse 37 there, Matthew 5, 37, let your communications be yea, yea, or nay, nay. Instead of swearing by this and like, oh, you know, you talk to people and you ask them, did you see so and so? Oh, I swear I didn't do it. I swear. You know, that's, it's like just yes or no. Let your yea be yea. Be, keep your words and communication simple. Let your words be enough. So then uh, the next one, an eye for an eye. Um, you know, Jesus tells us to turn the other cheek. So revenge does not belong to us. Uh, Matthew 6, go ahead and turn to Matthew 6 while you're there. Next page, maybe? It's the next page for me. Matthew 6, 12 through 15 says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive, forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And then in Luke 11, 4, which is the parallel text, and, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. So, you know, revenge does not belong to us. So if someone hits us, we don't hit them back. If It's not an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Look at... Uh, well, I'll read Deuteronomy 32, 35. To me belongeth vengeance. This is God talking. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. And then let's, uh, since we're close, let's turn to Romans 12, and let's look at 14 through 21. Romans 12, 14 through 21. Fourteen says, "Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but con uh, condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth to you, live peaceably." with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So, turn the other cheek. Now, the next one is about if you get sued... Or if you have a judgment against you, how about that for a relevance? Um, it says to give, give your cloak also. So let's turn to Deuteronomy 24. I'm going to see this. Deuteronomy 24, verses 10 through 13. You know, in, in our, I guess in, in our day, in our time, you know, the wardrobes have changed and the cloak what is the cloak okay well the cloak would have been used as um, collateral and the cloak was something that you couldn't take from a poor person okay so let's read that Deuteronomy 24 10 to 13 when thou dost lend thy brother anything thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge that's his collateral his pledge Thou shalt stand abroad, and the man to whom thou dost lend shall bring out the pledge abroad unto thee. And if the man be poor, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. In any case, thou shalt deliver him the pledge again where the sun goeth down, that he may sleep in his own raiment, his own clothes, and bless thee, and it shall be righteous unto thee before the Lord thy God. So the cloak was this thing that was sort of untouchable by the law. You couldn't take the cloak. But Jesus is saying if, if you rightfully get sued by the law, then you should not only give what what is the judgment against you, but just give them your cloak too. 
So this sort of sacred thing that you were supposed to keep, he's saying, just give it to him also. Make things right with every man. And then the next one, hate your enemies. Hate thine enemies. That's what has been said of old. Um, uh, Where's that at? Verse uh, 48. Forty-three. You have heard in, in Matthew five forty-three. You have heard that it has been said, "Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy." But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Romans twelve fourteen, which we read earlier, bless them which persecute you, bless and not curse. And I want to say this that. Keep in mind that we were enemies of God. Let's turn to Romans 5. And let's read Romans 5, 8 through 10. Romans 5, 8 is a very popular verse. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So before accepting Christ as our Savior, we were the enemies of God. And then in Colossians 1, go ahead and turn there. Colossians 1, 19-22. It says in verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross... To him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. So again, we were the enemies of God. And God loved us, did he not? We are to love our enemies as well. And that can be difficult sometimes. It can be difficult to define who your enemy is, but you are to love. We're to love our enemies. So, um, you know, that la- the, the verse, just reemphasize, reread that Matthew 5, 48. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And I want to encourage you that, to know that we are perfect in Christ. Uh, back to Colossians 1, if you're still there. Colossians 1, 25 through 29. Verse 25 says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we, we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So notice in verse 28 at the end, that we may present every man perfect, not in ourselves, but in Christ Jesus. And then let's turn to Hebrews 10. And that's where we're going to be our last uh, text Hebrews 10 12 through 17 so verse 12 says but this man this man is Jesus after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool for by one offering he hath perfected Forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So the focus of that verse is number, or that passage is number 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So, you know, God wants us to live perfect, and uh, we can live perfect through him. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we're going to have a closing hymn.
So we'll stand to our feet and we'll do a closing hymn. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for...